special presentation from 12 News. I have ordered a stay at home order for all of the people of Rhode Island. Now, one year into the pandemic, thousands of local cases, thousands of lives lost. Friends and family separated for months, masks, isolation. You've been wearing your masks, you've been keeping appropriate social distance, and it has worked. But also through it all, resilience and heroes among us. And now to hope as people begin rolling up their sleeves to get vaccinated. This is COVID-19, one year later, heartache, heroes, and hope. One year later, we are still very much in this pandemic. But finally, there's a feeling of hope. Good evening, I'm Shannon Heggie. I'm Mike Montecalvo. Rhode Island saw its first case one year ago today. March 1st, 2020, a day that changed our lives. Since then, healthcare workers spending hours away from home and their families on the brink of exhaustion, fighting this virus and saving lives. Face masks, part of our lives. It's now normal to see them on the streets, at work, and even in some cases at home, all to protect yourself and others. Some classrooms empty as home became school. One year later, this is a look back at how it all started and how far we've come. 2020, a year marked by heartache, loneliness, helplessness, but also signs of kindness when we least expected it, and now glimmers of hope. December 2019, our world changed. The first case of the virus was detected in what would soon be known as the origin of a pandemic, Wuhan, China. If the virus turns out to be readily transmissible from human to human, then we'll have a much larger problem. With the start of 2020 came the first case in the U.S. in Washington state. By the end of January, coronavirus was declared a public health emergency. Still locally, it seemed like a distant issue. February 1st, Massachusetts had its first case. March 1st, we discovered what we believe is the first case of coronavirus here in the state of Rhode Island. A staff member at St. Ray's Academy contracted it in Italy, where the virus was quickly spreading. By March 17th, visitors were banned from nursing homes in Rhode Island. Restaurants shifted to takeout only. Schools in Massachusetts closed for what was supposed to be just three weeks. And on March 20th, Rhode Island shut down in-person learning for two weeks after moving up spring break the week before. Weddings were canceled. Toilet paper and hand sanitizer in short supply and high demand. Then on March 27th, state police began stopping drivers coming in from New York. Knock it off. You remember Governor Raimondo coining this phrase in her then daily COVID briefings as Rhode Island reported its first two deaths from the virus on the 28th of March. Masks were required for most workers to wear in Rhode Island starting April 16th. Despite President Trump's goal of reopening the country by Easter. And what a great timeline that would be. This was the reality in Rhode Island. By the end of April, Rhode Island was reaching its peak in cases. Walk-up and drive-through testing sites became more readily available. Across the country, cases were spreading in processing plants, causing a temporary meat shortage. Then, a bit of hope in the form of nicer weather. By mid-May, state parks reopened, as did restaurants with restrictions. McCoy Stadium turned into an outdoor dining experience. We have gone above and beyond to make our kids safe. Fall semester meant some type of in-person learning for most school districts, as Rhode Island led the nation at the time in testing per capita. Then Halloween, indoor gatherings proved to be spreaders. In anticipation of a Thanksgiving surge, Rhode Island entered into what was supposed to be a two-week pause on November 30th. It turned into three weeks. As December arrived, so did patients at the state's two field hospitals. <laughs> December 14th meant some hope. The state's first vaccines kicking off an effort to vaccinate thousands in health care and nursing homes by year's end. Our special coverage continues on WPRI.com where we have an interactive timeline of the key events from the year 2020 and how we got to where we are today. I'm Kate Walsh, 12 News. Over the last year, incredible progress has been made against this devastating virus. And now, a shot of hope. Brandon Truitt spoke to one healthcare hero who says she's already seeing a difference from vaccinations. 
Julia Alves has been a nurse at Rhode Island Hospital for more than a decade. She works in the ICU. It is a stressful and high pressure job on a normal day, much less in a pandemic. The full impacts of this virus realized when it came knocking on her door. It was crazy. It was a very busy and exciting day. For many of us, life has seemingly hit a pause button over the last year. I work with um, patients on ventilators. Canceled events, few reasons to leave the house. We've been forced to slow down. That's simply not the case for Julia Alves. I work pretty much with the sickest of the sick. We first met the 36-year-old nurse in December, part of that historic day, the first vaccinations in Rhode Island. You can see Julia just to the left there, standing by for her shot at history. I feel great. I'm very excited about the vaccine. At that time, Rhode Island was in the thick of it, averaging more than 1,000 daily cases. Hospitalizations peaked that very week, too. Towards the end, it started to get a little emotionally exhausting, and you almost feel defeated because a lot of those patients, they walk into the hospital by themselves and then they don't end up leaving the hospital and we saw a lot of that. That was the hardest part? That was the hardest part, yes. Julia has seen COVID take patient after patient and witnessing the worst of the virus started to add up. 12 hour shift and then you gotta go home and be a mom. Yes. By the time I got home, I think I was drained in between Working in the ICU with COVID patients, going home with kids being home, trying to do homeschooling, it, it's a lot. Julia is married with two children, ages 7 and 14, the virus making its way into her home when her husband tested positive in November. He recovered, but her mother got it too. She was taken to the hospital. But I, I, what I remember the most is bringing her in and not being able to come into the hospital with her. I understand exactly what those people are going through, not being able to be here with their loved ones. Her mother has recovered and has since been vaccinated, and there has been great debate over those vials of hope and the rush to get it out. But Julia says she's already feeling the difference. ICU numbers are down, the lowest they've been in months. So definitely a difference. A very big difference. What is your hope for this vaccine and what it might mean for us moving forward? Hopefully everybody will get vaccinated because it seems to be working. So I hope people do get vaccinated because so that way we can eventually get rid of this pandemic. In the meantime, Julia echoing what doctors have been saying, masks and social distancing are going to be around for a while, but a sense of normalcy doesn't feel that far away. Brandon Truitt, 12 News. And more and more of us will be able to get a COVID-19 vaccine soon, if you haven't already, and you probably have a lot of questions. In our latest 12 on 12 digital original, Vaccine 101, we're taking your questions straight to the experts and getting answers, like this question. What are the known side effects and adverse reactions that can occur when I get a COVID-19 vaccine? Can you take pain relievers before or after the shot? So somewhere between 50 and 80% of people after the first or the second shot are gonna get some body aches, maybe a headache, even a low grade fever. You might feel a little fatigued. You're gonna feel kind of crummy, like you're fighting off a virus. Again, that is normal and nothing to be scared of. It just shows that the vaccine is working. If you do get those symptoms, you can take Tylenol or acetaminophen, or you can take ibuprofen, also known as Motrin or Advil, to try to manage the symptoms and allow you to feel better while your immune system is mounting a response and protecting your body. You can find the answers to many more questions right now on WPRI.com and on the 12 News app. Our coverage of COVID-19 one year later, heartache, heroes, and hope continues. Coming up, we're hearing from those on the front lines of this life-saving battle. What hard lessons they say the pandemic has taught us all. First, a special thank you from 12 News anchor Chelsea Jones. Where do I begin? We couldn't have done this without you. Here's a huge thank you to all of the doctors braving this virus day in and out. If it wasn't for your courage and endurance, we wouldn't have made it this far. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 2020 was a year marked by pain and trials. But also triumph. I think we had great challenge, but we came together as a group. 
With victories like vaccines in 2021, we're beginning to pick up the pieces that coronavirus chipped away. Chelsea Jones has details on what one doctor and nurse say this pandemic has taught us all. Fostering a culture of collaboration with a singular focus on protecting people is what Dr. Leonard Murmel says was the beauty in this pandemic. And he's worked through both the SARS and Ebola outbreaks, but says COVID was different by far. COVID presented just challenges that, that were truly unforeseen. One day, everything changed. Life as we knew it was no longer. A virus crept into the United States silently, taking people's breath away, literally. It was hard, extremely hard, not gonna lie. These frontline workers springing into action without second thought, saying COVID-19 brought challenges that were both daunting and scary. Because when it first hit, there were just so many unknowns. How um, quickly it spread, dealing with a lot of misinformation. We didn't have, as you know, any treatment and we didn't have a vaccine. Doctors, nurses, infectious disease experts tasked with figuring it all out as trials continued to arise. We had shortages of masks. We had shortages, you know, ran out of uh, uh, you know, Purell. Uh, we had shortages of gowns. We had shortages of gloves. We had shortages of the wipes we used to clean equipment. Nurse Elza Malkasian, married mother of two, was hit with a new routine. We had set up a little area in our garage where I would, you know, strip down and make sure that that attire, the shoes, everything stayed there. 12 plus hour shifts burdened with changing clothes just to walk into her own house. After working such a long shift and countless hours, like the first thing you want to do is hug and, and kiss them and you can't. Things becoming even more challenging when she fell victim to the virus too. I got to have a little glimpse of what these patients could feel and experience being alone in the hospital setting. But Elza would recover and with her own built-in immunity. I had decided that I wanted to um, go and work at the field hospital. Her experience with COVID creating a new mission as a nurse. Where you tried to put your emotions and your feelings aside and know that you're here to care for them, um, to not show them that you're fearful or nervous, that you're really here to help better them and to get them home to their loved ones. And you see, that's the charm with this virus, people going above the call of duty to help. We are much farther along than we were, you know, even, you know six months ago. Evolution. The pandemic hit hard, but the fight back was even harder. Modern medicine showing its power with the creation of the vaccine, a welcome sign of hope. That we will still be able to have family cookouts and, you know, hug our loved ones and spend time with them. That this was a rough year, but better times are ahead of us for sure. The future is almost impossible to predict, but Dr. Murmel says we've learned a lot. He says the pandemic has pointed out significant disparities that need to be resolved, but it's also shown things like wearing your mask can play a big role in minimizing health risk. One year later, many lessons that will continue to shape our country in the years to come. I'm Chelsea Jones, 12 News. Back in April, we launched 12 Response to help answer questions from people struggling during the pandemic. We have answered thousands of inquiries, ranging from how to navigate the unemployment system to early questions about how to get tested to state restrictions and vaccinations. Now, a year later, 12 Response is a permanent part of what we do here at 12 News. We're joined by Target 12 investigator Tim White, who's part of the team that got this project off the ground. Tim, 12 Response has truly mushroomed it since has. it launched. Yeah. and is really such part of our coverage right now. Yeah, you know, Mike, just to give you a sense, we have received more than 20,000 inquiries into 12 Response since April, and there's a team of people here working on the project, and we have individually answered a majority of those emails, and it's such a valuable tool uh, as a way for us to keep a finger on the community. And if I could, I'd like to give just one example. We started to get flooded with questions from people who said they were getting letters 
from the state about their unemployment benefits when they didn't apply for any. So we started poking around and uncovered a massive fraud scheme where people were getting their identity stolen. From there, we were able to do several reports on what people could do about it. And it was that kind of interaction that was essential in this case. And we flagged it because of 12 responds and viewers who reached out. I know from seeing these stories, you often connected with people who reached out to 12 responds directly. Well, isn't that one of our the best parts Absolutely. of our jobs is, is meeting people. But unfortunately, it's often when they're in distress and need help. And as you said, we would often get an inquiry into 12 responds, and I would hop on a Zoom with them to talk them through a possible solution to their problem. Here's some examples. It's very stressful. I don't even know how that happened. How am I going to put in a claim? Because they're going to think it's fraud and I'm the legitimate, you know, I'm putting in the legitimate claim. And I'll email you that answer and I'm going to email you that link as well uh, to, uh, to get in touch with them directly. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Tim. I really appreciate your help. All right, Mickey, hang in there. But anyways, I want to thank you very much uh, for doing such a great job and, and I appreciate you getting back to me so fast. Uh, thank you. Tim, as Target 12 continues its primary goal of in-depth investigations, this has been one of the ways of focusing that expertise at really a critical time. Yeah, you're really right. We saw an urgent need and jumped in to help. But if, if you think about it, Mike, we're still using the same fundamental approach we always have, which is prying loose answers through our sources and contacts, getting critical information from different government agencies, sometimes by filing public record requests. And these are all things we employ on a daily basis, but then we use the tools to help people navigate red tape individually. We then tell that story in the hopes that it will be helpful to thousands of others. And so many people have reached out. They really Target are. 12 investigator Tim White, thank you very much. You can send us your questions. Just click on 12 Response on WPRI.com to reach out to our team. COVID-19, one year later, heartache, heroes, and hope. Coming up after the break, hear from the head of the state's pandemic response, Dr. Nicole Alexander-Scott, what she says comforts her on her hardest days. Plus. If my dad had died, it would have been devastating, but he would have died trying to help people. It would have fit his legacy. A legacy of survival from a healthcare worker who came out of retirement to save lives. His message for those who are scared. But first, here's Brandon Truitt. I don't have enough nice things to say about nurses. You are the right-hand men and women that are keeping our doctors' offices and hospitals going. You've been working around the clock. We are grateful for you. We appreciate you. Thank you. Just last week, a somber memorial at the White House for the more than 500,000 Americans who've died. That includes about 2,500 in Rhode Island. One situate man knows all too well the dangers of COVID a respiratory therapist who rushed to the front lines to tackle the virus head on and eventually got sick himself. Now Frank Mooney has a message for people who are scared. Just keep going and laugh. So I'm going to attack you too. <laughs> the game makes us laugh and it brings people together and that's part of healing too. Bringing a little laughter <laughs> during a challenging time. I started feeling very tired. Frank Mooney is a COVID survivor. The Situate resident started feeling sick after coming out of retirement and going back to work as a respiratory therapist. Frank's wife wasn't on board. My wife was very against me going back. She said, you can't go back. You only put the, you don't have to go back. A one-time commercial fisherman, Mooney spent 25 years taking care of patients. If a fire breaks out on a boat, you run to the fire. If, if something's going on, a pandemic, the best place to fight it is in the hospital. If you don't fight it in the hospital, it will catch up with you. You can't run away from it. Frank ran straight into the pandemic and got sick. I was extremely tired. I couldn't eat. I was coughing a little bit, a little bit of a fever. He was admitted into Kent Hospital. COVID-19 tests continued to come back negative. He also had trouble taking deep breaths. Finally, a diagnosis. And I coughed up something in the cup and they ran that through the lab. And they found that I was positive for COVID that way. Isolated in the hospital for 10 days with no visitors allowed, he was more worried about his loved ones at home. I'm concerned about how they're doing. I'm thinking I'm going to be okay. You never thought you were going to die? No. Thankfully, a ventilator wasn't necessary. Daughter Justine Mooney. Were you worried he was going to die? Yes. <laughs> like that's, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and I was, I was afraid that we 
wouldn't be there with him. If my dad had died, it would have been devastating. But he would have died trying to help people. It would have fit his legacy. Despite the darkness of COVID, Frank says don't live your life in fear. Three, three, four. That's why his daughter Justine and her boyfriend Mark Clancy created Year at Play, a break from reality card game. Oh, two toilet paper. COVID hair, it could be Pizzagate, it could be lockdown. Yap is a game based on current events with satirical spins. A little poor roadie. Uh. The first person who receives 21 shame points loses. If your defense number is lower than my attack number, I can come after you. <laughs> a chance to enjoy each other's company and thankful everything turned out okay. My dad is my hero. He is my best friend. Since I was like a little girl, if I thought of something happening to him, I, I could easily like just start tearing up. It was a good two months before he started feeling better. Frank says he coughs a little more than he used to, but still walked nine holes carrying a golf bag last year. So who's been most affected in Rhode Island? Since last March, 30 to 39-year-olds have seen the highest number of cases. 50 to 59-year-olds come next, and the age group with the fewest cases, 90 and over. But of course, no one has been hit harder than the elderly when it comes to overall deaths. Now, one person who's become a household name this past year is Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott. The director of Rhode Island's health department has been at the forefront of the state's coronavirus response, grilled by reporters and making sweeping public health decisions. Our Kim Kalunian sat down with her to take a look back and to ask where we go from here. Dr. Alexander Scott's father always knew she would become a doctor. Her mother became a nurse, despite being told the color of her skin would prohibit that. Now, as a parent herself, Dr. Alexander Scott tells me on her hardest days, it's her son who brings her solace. Around that February time. Away from the podium and the spotlights of the vet's auditorium, Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott reflects on what landed her the leading role in the state's coronavirus response. Interestingly enough, I was drawn to public health uh, when the last pandemic was here. H1N1. It was 2009 when Dr. Alexander Scott got her feet wet responding to a public health crisis. February of 2020 reminded her of those days. You certainly hope that you don't have too many pandemics in uh, your career and you can never imagine what each additional pandemic is going to be like. Um, so um, I wouldn't say it was a total surprise, uh, but it was also something that uh, no one could have imagined. The first case of coronavirus. From day one. We are being extremely vigilant. Alexander Scott was the public voice of public health, delivering the hopeful. We are moving in the right direction. Alongside the heartbreaking. Sadly, we have two additional fatalities. And taking the heat. Leader. She has continued to be engaged One, directly with us. Questions. Thank you for your question. Well, some of the longer days may have been times when uh, people were rightfully concerned or questioned or even angry about what they were experiencing. And I had to acknowledge that. One year into the pandemic, more than 2,300 Rhode Islanders have lost their lives. Alexander Scott says she's driven daily by the motivation to keep that number from climbing and buoyed by the blessings, big and small, in her own life. How has this experience changed you personally and professionally? In many ways, definitely in many ways. I'd say the um, most prominent, I think having lost my father at a young age, it already taught me to have a sense of uh, appreciation just for what you have and for life and not taking things for granted. Uh, so I already had a, an element of that and certainly the pandemic really strengthened that understanding. Dr. Alexander Scott tells me she doesn't look back on 2020 with any regrets, but says there were many lessons learned. As far as the future, she was confirmed to another five-year term by the Senate just last year. Incoming Governor Dan McKee says he plans to keep her in charge of the state's coronavirus response. I'm Kim Kalunian, 12 News. Our coverage of COVID-19 one year later continues. Coming up, 12 News This Morning anchors Patrick Little and Danielle North tell us about a labor of love keeping families connected at a local nursing home. Plus, a Bristol teacher who's become a bright light for her students during these dark times. But first, 12 News reporter Alexandra Leslie with a thank you for teachers. 
Teachers, you've had one of the hardest jobs during this pandemic and don't get nearly enough credit for all the extra work you've put in. Thank you for keeping children educated and entertained during this tough time. We're taking a look at COVID-19 one year later. There have been hundreds of stories of heartbreak at our long-term care facilities. And I've never been in a situation where I think we felt very helpless that um, we had people that needed to be with their families and feel that love and that connection. More than 1,400 Rhode Islanders in nursing homes died of COVID over the past year. You know, so many of our long-term care staff members worked extra hours and wore so many extra hats to try to help out during the crisis. At Oakland Grove Healthcare in Woonsocket, they lost some 30 men and women, and their social services director knew early on they had to help keep families connected. In the early days of the pandemic, there was a palpable shift in the halls of many long-term care facilities as they dealt with crippling numbers of COVID-19 cases. The staff here um, did amazing things. Um, they really just stepped right up. So you would think, you know, it's scary. We were all, we were afraid. We had no idea um, how we would go through COVID and how it would affect us in our personal lives. We had no idea how it would affect the families and the residents. And I think that the staff here just really stepped up. But Katie Rasco knew they had to go beyond just stepping up at the Oakland Grove Healthcare Center. They had to focus on reaching out with so many families not able to see their loved ones in person. So I've been here for about 13 years um, and I've never been in a situation where I think we felt very helpless that um, we had people that needed to be with their families and feel that love and that connection and um, we couldn't allow that. And that's when an online connection turned into an unexpected gift. Rosalind Yasura offered to hand crochet and knit these special red hearts for men and women who were receiving end of life care. We had, I would say, about 30 patients that received the hearts, the families. We um, put them, whether we had to pin them, um, we had patients that held them in their hands, um, and then we sent the matching heart to the families um, with a little love note so that they knew that they were connected in some way. And while Katie showed such compassion during loss, she also knew it was important to celebrate those who survived COVID and the staff that endured so much pain during the past year. She organized a Heroes Parade with an extra twist. It was a birthday celebration for someone who was 100 and had beat COVID, as well as just a thank you to all the staff here that were working so hard and doing such a good job. So it was a very emotional night. There were a lot of tears. Um, and it's definitely something I won't ever forget. And now as the Oakland Grove Center progresses with completing life-saving vaccinations, Katie can start to see hope in what felt like a hopeless situation for so many days. I am looking forward to the bingo, the bingo argument, the patients in the hallways, the getting heckled by the patients, um, families walking in and out through the front door without being tempted. Uh, I'm just looking for the, the heartbeat of long-term care to return to the hallways. Really, all of us are, right? So Katie was honored with a COVID-19 Hero Award, an anonymous donor contributing $28,000. So 67 different nominated healthcare heroes received a small token for their compassion and tireless efforts over this past year. And that's absolutely amazing. And this is just one of the many heroes of the pandemic. Another group of heroes, teachers. They're, of course, they've been forced to make many changes over the past year. And I have to say, I just feel really blessed. I feel like we're, we're making the best of it and we're um, working together and I think the children are thriving. You know, Pat, there are just so many teachers that yeah. deserve recognition over this past year. And I wish we could highlight all of you, but right now we're focusing on a teacher in Bristol who shined during some of our darkest days. Caleb's ready, Brian's ready, terrific. Oh, thumbs up and a smile. Thank you for remembering that. It's a Thursday morning at Gutierrez Elementary School in Bristol, and first grade teacher Kristen Kerwin sits alone in her classroom. But she really isn't alone at all. Good morning, Mr. Kerwin. 
Nice to see you. And here comes Sydney. Good morning, Sydney. Kerwin is what you would call a distance learning specialist. She has 24 six and seven year old students, and this full time virtual class consists of kids from two separate elementary schools in town. Even my students now, I feel like their technology is probably beyond me even. Um, but yeah, you know, it just, it took a lot of, um, of learning and just kind of um, seeing what works and seeing what doesn't work. Kerwin has taught at Gutierrez for over 10 years. After the pandemic hit last spring, she knew virtual instruction was here to stay for a while. So last summer during her time off, Kristen decided she wanted to get better at it. So I did take the summer to do some other um, professional development so I could um, excel in the technology piece. And then when um, the fall came around, I really had some new tools and ideas. Yes. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. You got it. Nice job. Nice, great job sticking it out. Um, but it's really been a positive um, reaction from the parents. Uh, the kids in Mrs. Kerwin's class are keeping up academically with the in-school students. But I think what she's really excelling at is just connecting with the kids, and she's created a real sense of community. If I missed anyone, you can yell at me and say, you missed me. Okay, good. Whew, that's great. Um, this class is comprised of two separate schools. So a lot of the students have never even met each other in person, and, or they've never, my son's never met her in person. She just listens to them and connects to them in a way that um, I just think is so valuable. I just feel really blessed. I feel like we're, we're making the best of it and we're um, working together and I think the children are thriving as best as we can. They're the real heroes. They really, they work hard every day. They show up for me every day and um, I'm just so proud to be a part of this. That was one of the worries I had as a principal um, for our distance learning teachers is whether or not they were going to be able to make those connections. Um, and Kristen did it. She did it. And, and I, think she's, I think she's right. The smile that you get to see through the camera, yeah, you wish you could hug them too, but um, the smile that she's able to see, she sees those smiles every day. And when you ask these kids who their favorite teacher is, well, it's someone they have never even met. And with the kids learning from home in this class, Kerwin, one of the few teachers that actually gets to see their full faces and the smiles because they're not wearing masks at home. So she's enjoyed the experience of teaching virtually, but is definitely really looking forward to seeing the children in person once again. She is obviously a bright light for those kids during these times. It's amazing that so many of us really feel the impacts at this time, really on our mental, physical, and emotional health. And some of the groups that are hit hardest by the impacts of the coronavirus have been older older adults and young children. State of Rhode Island is offering this free mental health hotline if you or someone you know is dealing with mental health issues due to the pandemic. Call this number. It's right there on your screen. 414-LINK. We really just want to take a moment to thank all of you, the health care heroes to our teachers. That's right. Students, parents, and friends, it was a year like no other and one we will hopefully never, ever see again. For Daniel North, I'm Patrick Little. Well, heroes come in many forms, from doctors and nurses to lab techs. They put their own health and safety at risk to care for others. Kim Kaloudian spoke with two local medical workers who say working on the front lines has changed their lives. Well, we are all likely experiencing a little bit of COVID-19 fatigue, but for our healthcare workers, there is no reprieve from the virus that's been dominating the headlines and our lives for a year. You don't even get to go to go to work and like forget about it for a little bit because you go to work to take care of it. Dr. Vincent Varamo was a physician at Kent Hospital's ER and the Care New England Field Hospital in Cranston. At this point, he's no stranger to COVID and recalls one night this spring where the influx of sick patients was both staggering and heartbreaking. Within 15 minutes, 10 minutes, you know, you realize that you're going to have to put this patient on a ventilator and talking that patient through that, you know, and there's no family that can be in the room with them during this time. After that, that was just the beginning of the shift. And then after that, seeing several more people during the course of that shift, it, that was a particularly rough day. While Varamo was out front seeing patients. We were definitely front lines, but in the background. Carrie Kempke is working behind the scenes to determine which patients have the virus. She's the lab manager at Westerly Hospital, and in her 22 years in the field, she's never seen anything like this. This definitely puts into perspective why we do what we do. You know, 
we, you always hear about this stuff. You hear about the possibility. You hear it on the news, but you never think it's going to happen. Kemke recalls one night where they were flooded with 500 tests. It was an overwhelming task for her crew that came well after they had identified their first positive case, a moment she remembers well. It was very scary. I, I know I was scared, and I know my staff was scared, and I said, you know, we're, we just got to do what we got to do. You know, we, this is what we do, and we're going we're gonna to be okay. Fear, Kemke says, is something she tries to keep out of her mind. But Veramo says it's important for people to remember healthcare workers are humans too. It is mentally draining, but trying to get through this together is essentially what some of us, you know, we go to work and that's one of the things we look for the most is, is that camaraderie because you, you feel like after you can go through a lot of this, you can feel like you can take care of anything after this point. And Kemke shared some good news when we spoke, saying earlier this month they had their first day in a long time where they didn't identify any positive cases. She said it doesn't mean we're out of the woods just yet, but it was certainly cause for celebration in her lab. I'm Kim Kalunian, 12 News. COVID-19, one year later, heartache, heroes, and hope continues. Two local teachers called to help not only students, but also Rhode Island and its residents. Before that, here's Kate Walsh with another 12 salutes. A heartfelt thank you to our grocery workers. There's no working from home option for you. You show up every day face to face with the public working to keep us fed, whether that's stocking shelves, compiling delivery orders, or working the register. You are truly essential. Thank you. Among the many heroes who stepped up during the pandemic were our educators, adapting to teaching from home or in classrooms that looked very different. 12 News reporter Steph Machado has the story of how two teachers stepped up to help Rhode Island in a very unique way. Most members of the Rhode Island National Guard have full-time jobs outside the military, such as police officers, construction workers, or nurses, but only a small handful are teachers, and they became crucial when the Guard stepped up to tackle the pandemic. Down by the bay. Down by the bay. How to sing together without being together. Down. Back to my home. Back to my home. It was a problem Exeter West Greenwich music teacher Kristen Marcotte had to solve quickly when school shut down in March 2020. All of a sudden, now I'm homeschooling my kids, and then I had to, you know, switch to distance learning with my school. My mother will say. My mommy will say. She started making videos from home with her kids for her elementary students to sing along. Cause if I do. It wasn't the same as just being in the classroom. But Marcotte soon had a new challenge to tackle. She's also a sergeant first class in the Rhode Island National Guard, where more than a thousand soldiers and airmen were called up to help with the pandemic response in the state. She started at TF Green, handing out information to travelers about quarantining, then conducted contact tracing for the Department of Health. Finally, over the summer, a new assignment tailor made for a teacher. We were just told, hey, we would like to help out. K-12 community. Our request for training is our second biggest category. The team she joined was eventually called the Education Operations Center, or EDOC, set up to help schools reopen in person in fall 2020. The EDOC, run by the Guard, responded to schools with COVID cases, answered questions about contact tracing and quarantine, delivered hundreds of air purifiers to classrooms, and more recently, the EDOC has been helping with in-school COVID testing. We're here to support the schools in whatever way we can. Sergeant First Class Dennis Mendes is another member of the EDOC. When he's not on orders with the Guard, he's a science teacher at Cranston High School West. When we met Mendes on a recent Tuesday, he and Army Public Health Nurse John Pizzo were training school nurses and administrators on how to use the Binax Now rapid COVID test. And then repeat the process in the other nostril. So I firmly believe that the heart of a teacher is to not only just teach, but to also instruct and help other people. And that's kind of what I'm doing here. It's just I don't have papers to correct my own. Mendes and Marcotte say helping with the pandemic and working in the EDOC has been rewarding. I didn't outrank anybody in that room, but when it came to K-12 community, I really had a voice. I can learn, I will learn. As they also look forward to getting back to their students when this is all over. I, I do miss teaching. I, I honestly, I honestly do. I can't wait to, to get back into the classroom. Great job. At any given time, there are roughly two dozen members of the National Guard working in the Education Operations Center. The plan is to keep it open as long as it's needed. I'm Steph Machado, 12 News. 
In the past year, Massachusetts has seen over 540,000 COVID-19 cases, more than 54,000 of those in Bristol County. This virus has claimed the lives of more than 15,000 Bay State residents, including 1,400 in Bristol County. 2020 was certainly a year of heartache for many. That's why we launched 12 Remembers and asked you to submit the names of your lost loved ones in an effort to highlight their lives and keep their memories alive. Like Joan Kershaw Swan, a dedicated Kent Hospital employee for nearly 50 years, first a nurse and then an ICU employee. She was also a loving mother, stepmother, and grandmother. COVID-19 also claiming the life of her longtime companion, Artie Hughes. For more than 46 years, Artie greeted customers at Warwick's Greenwood Inn restaurant with his larger-than-life personality. A loving father and grandfather, Artie was also a graduate of Providence College who served our country during the Korean War. 82-year-old Lenny Marshland, a caring, funny husband and father, was also a big New York Yankees fan. COVID-19 sent him to the hospital in April with what doctors thought was pneumonia. He died just two days later. Lenny's family says he was loved by many, his death leaving behind a trail of broken hearts. Roland Laflame of Johnston was a big brother, the oldest of seven. A theater teacher at Salve Regina University for 35 years, he also loved Disney. His family says his legacy will live on through the numerous theater-related books he collected that they plan to donate to Salve Regina. Among these many deaths, Sister Mary Angelis Gabriel, the 93-year-old, was beloved by all who knew her, blessed with a kind heart and spirit that changed people's lives every day. Sister Mary Angelis served as principal of St. Peter's School in Warwick for 29 years before retiring at the age of 74. She never stopped working, visiting up to 200 elderly and sick people right up until the day she died, a day her friends say she waited for and welcomed. She lived, I believe, her entire life for the day when she died because all of her good works, all of her loving Jesus, and that's the day she planned for. That was what her life was about. For anyone who knew her, Sister Mary Angelis will be how she celebrated life, not death, that they will continue to remember. COVID-19, one year later, heartache, heroes, and hope continues. Coming up, local businesses that have managed to not just survive this pandemic, but also thrive. First, here's Kim Kalunian. 12 News wants to say a special thank you to all of the students. We know this past year has been hard, and you've made a lot of sacrifices. You've missed proms, sports games, musicals, and milestones, but we know your futures are going to be bright. So thank you for doing your part to keep us all healthy and safe. It's no secret, this pandemic has hit businesses hard. Some had to shut down altogether, others are barely making ends meet. But then there are those who pivoted, got creative, and are not only surviving, but thriving. Sure, you got the right concentration, because if it's too high or too low, it doesn't work, you know. As scientists work feverishly in labs on a COVID-19 vaccine, Matt Richardson works in a lab of his own, crafting the beer he's brewed with passion and love for six years here at Tilted Barn in Exeter. The new cooler is bigger than the square footage of the old tap room in the old barn. Holds a lot more beer too. But now he's making three times more. They had just broken ground on the new barn in February. To Matt's surprise, the pandemic actually helped speed up construction. A lot of other projects were put on hold, and so we kind of were given full attention from so many different contractors. All right, you guys are going to be at Staple 10. They opened in November with weekend reservations filling up in 24 hours. Their operating costs are up significantly, though, thanks to a can shortage. With all the bars and restaurants closed, there was a time for maybe maybe four or five months that there was no draft beer to be had. He's had to buy cans by the truckload at $30,000 a pop. Thankfully, restrictions at restaurants have eased, but restaurants have taken a beating. The state's Hospitality Association says in that sector alone, 30 to 35 Rhode Island businesses have closed permanently since the pandemic began. Another 140 have gone into hibernation for a few months. Then there's Gray's on Main in East Greenwich, one of the 10,123 new businesses to open in 2020. The Secretary of State's office telling Target 12 it's the first time the state has seen more than 10,000 in a single 
single year. When the charcuterie provision shop opened its doors the week of Thanksgiving, they were already booked solid. Our boards are became looks like become everybody's centerpiece in this in this uh, very uh, different entertainment. Over in Coventry, hey everybody, Hello. welcome to the live. We're here at the Bead Sting. I'm Jan. This is Britt. Jan Olivier, co-owner of the Bead Sting gift shop, was in debt before the pandemic began. These run twenty dollars, so ultra mini are twenty dollars. When everyone went on lockdown. <laughs> She went on Facebook Live four times a week for four hours at a time. Hundreds of her customers tune in for new products, giveaways, and sales. These are cute new little yard stakes here. This one says a spoiled rotten dog lives here. She says they've done nearly 10 times more volume in sales compared to last year, hired three more people, and expanded another 1,500 square feet to fit all the merchandise. We're gonna be table 11. As customers start filing in at noon on a Friday, it's not lost on Matt Richardson how incredible and challenging the past year has been. How fortunate do you feel that you have expanded, survived, thrived in the middle of what's been the hardest year for most businesses, not just in Rhode Island, but across the country? We talk about that all the time. Counting his blessings that at least beer seems to be pandemic proof. From birthday parades to hospital flyovers, 2020 had most of us finding different and unique ways to celebrate and show support to others. Brian Yukono looks at how many people made the best of it. As we abruptly learned being together wasn't an option, the reality of what it really means to be apart started to sink in. Bridging that gap had so many of you hitting the road. From drive-bys <laughs> to flybys. Our year of being socially distant meant finding new ways to connect. We saw a lot of flashing lights, like here outside Kent Hospital, a symbol of solidarity. I just believe that the support that we're showing is just hopefully to make someone smile tonight and uh, make them realize that we're stronger together. Stronger together when we felt so alone. These street side moments gave us a welcome distraction, turning isolation into celebrations of life. Movie favorites brighten the day for a five-year-old in Pawtucket. Fire trucks leading the way for a parade for a four-year-old named Mason in North Attleboro. And some major birthday milestones. Mary in Woonsocket turning 100 with a serenade of superheroes of both fiction and nonfiction. Westport's Fast Eddie turning 104 with appropriately 100 classic cars. We saw tow trucks and police cars, jeeps and minivans. It really didn't matter what you drove. This was about spreading joy. There's never been a more isolating moment in time for, for people in the hospital. This whole thing is about isolation, and Good Night Lake is all about connection. Graduation looked and felt very different, but the love was the same. They did a nice job today. They've done a nice job for the last three months under some difficult circumstances. We're very proud of what they've done. I'm just so happy for them. Proud parents, accomplished students, together overcoming a life obstacle no class could have prepared us for. Perhaps the lesson here was compassion, simple gestures, breaking the silence of isolation. My heart was going like this. Very, very happy, so excited. And remember, there is always good news happening. We have a section dedicated to that online right now at WPRI.com. I'm Brian Yacono, 12 News. As Brian mentioned, there is always something to be celebrated. Even if you have to look a little harder for it. Thank you for watching and reflecting back on the past year while looking ahead to a hopefully brighter future. I'm Shannon Heggie. I'm Mike Montecalvo. Enjoy a good night.